Ewald Meyer has recorded actually over 100 CDs. That's quite impressive. Uh, many of them solo CDs and also chamber music recordings. In 2007, he founded the Baroque orchestra Bach Concentus, which has made four recordings. Um, he is also active as a music theorist. His research has resulted in a PhD on, uh, on Johann Sebastian Bach's Art of the Fugue, a great book, um, performance practice based on German 18th century theory. And it was published at Leuven University Press 2013. And more recently, ha he has published um, an article on Fe Fedele Fenaroli's pedagogy in 18th century music. Um, he is also a, considered a specialist in Partimento, in a field in which he has produced several in important publications. The first critical edition of Ed uh, Fedele Fenaroli's Partimenti is available online, and a critical edition of the Parma manuscript, one of the earliest sources containing intavolatures or realizations by Fenaroli, is warmly recommended. Ewald de Meyer teaches harch, harpsichord, basso continuo, partimento, and improvisation at the Institut Supérieur Royal de Musique et de Pédagogie in Namur, and partimento, improvisation, counterpoint, and oratorio at this conservatory here in Antwerp. Please welcome Ewald. Set him up. Thank you very much. Just going to put this here. It's a bit weird to be at this side now, having been technician all day. <laughs> I have to admit that I prefer this side than that side. So um, today I will speak um, about one versetto by Stanislao Mattei. Mattei was a, a Bolognese composer, theorist, music pedagogue. And when I discovered his versetti, his 100 versetti, I was absolutely amazed by them. I find them particularly suitable for pedagogy. Not in the least because they are very short. That is, I think, one of the main problems that we all have when we deal with uh, teaching of partimento. When you give a partimento by Fenaroli, it's quite long. Students are often intimidated by them. It takes a lot of time before they can digest such a long partimento. And thus, when I came across this collection of um, hundred very short partimenti by Mattei in which a lot is uh, uh, potentially present, I was very, very excited about it. Um, as you see, the subtitle is Exploring Its Contrapuntal Possibilities. I will obviously speak uh, of that uh, quite extensively today, but this is something which is very important to know that today a lot of traditional harmony teachers or uh, practical counterpoint teachers are very happy and actually have to include myself also uh, in that category when students produce one beautiful realization of something. Historical evidence shows that uh, that was not the case in 18th century Italy at least, that students had to um, exhaust possibilities. So when they have one bass line or one canto, they had to write many, many, many versions. Peter and I looked through many counter books, counterpoint books from that time and era, and we are both astonished of the quality of those uh, counterpoint books. And we have seen up until 33 different versions of one 
kind of bass or one kind of uh, soprano. It is absolutely quite astonishing. So when dealing with Mattei, especially with the Versetti, this is a very important point that we, and this is what I would like to show to you, that we um, yeah, exhaust all possibilities. I will, I'm not able to show you all the possibilities, of course, today, otherwise we would be here for, for hours. But my, my, my uh, purpose today was still to go quite deep, so that I hope to show you. I will be extremely short about the historical uh, context. I have written a short essay on Mattei and the Versetti and his treaties. You can read that more uh, uh, later, that we can focus on music. So Mattei was, um, uh, as, I as, I, as I have said, was a Bolognese um, composer and theorist, pedagogue. And he is probably the most important pupil of another very famous name, Padre Martini. They were both uh, Padre, uh, by the way. And he was not only one of his most famous um, pupils, but he was also the successor. So he took over the class of Martini, so to speak. He even inherited the full library, which was quite extensive, by Martini. Right until the end, of, uh, um, he died in 25, 1825, and one year before he died, he published his uh, Opus Magnum, which was his Pratica d'accompagnamento, which was kind of an overview of um, yeah, all the material that he used during his pedagogical uh, career. But there is another source, that is the second one that I have mentioned here, which is from right the beginning of his, of his career as uh, a teacher, which already contains a lot of uh, fantastic material. And in that early source already, we have the 100 versetti. They are, they are also called like that, versetti. In the later source of 1824, they are not called versetti, versetti they are called SRCG, they are called just exercises. The reason that I've, that I've given uh, now those two sources is that we will see that there are some minor and very interesting differences that he has decided on a certain base in the context of 1788 and then for the for the publication he decided to change something about that and that was also important information for us that the base is not wholly territory that a given something is also material to be treated hands-on. In other words, that we, we don't have to play that bass literally. That we, when we can improve it, when we can put it into a larger context, we should, uh, we can, and we should do it. Also, want to um, to recommend strongly recommend the uh, wonderful edition that Peter made together with Matteo of the uh, of the verset, versetti. Matei, why is this edition so good? Because you have, it's, it is very clear, it's a beautifully set edition. But on top of that, you have in the first part the 100 versetti as they are, just one base, the base, uh, uh, the base lines. And in the second part, you have actually the opportunity of writing some ideas. There are two staves per versetto. So you have the base and then you have an empty stave for the right hand. When you want to write something, um, that's the place to do it. So this is the uh, essay which is already online that I have written on um, Matei, on, the, on, on the, the collection of 100 versets by Matei. There is also an excellent foreword in the edition by Peter and Matei. So very shortly, the design of the Versetti is very standardized. Mattei loves um, collections of four partimenti. So here you see that below on this page, you have four Versetti in C major. And before them, he gives some elementary exercises on scalar passages. 
on top you have very rudimentary, uh, I mean, it's just what we call today the rule of the octave, which is in a term they did not use, but anyway, that's what we call it uh, today. And then you have some moti del basso below, and you have some chromatic versions of the, of the scale. And that's quite adventurous. That's something which you don't find uh, earlier. So if you look, for instance, at the fifth line, it goes into quite some tonalities there. So that's, uh, that is something which is nice to, to explore. And so we have 100 versetti. This means that uh, we would perhaps expect 96 if we count well. When you think of all the keys, you arrive at so 24.5 uh, is, ni is 96, but he has uh, given four uh, versetti in G sharp minor and four versetti in A flat minor. So you have four bonus tracks, so to speak. We already spoke a little bit, uh, David and I spoke already a little bit about texture and about uh, setting. We strongly, we, uh, Peter, I, and other people who already plunged into Matei, strongly believe that Matei wanted his versetti to be realized mainly as three part, um, in, tri in three parts. So by adding two parts, there is historical evidence. We have some realizations by himself, not of the versetti, but of the second collection of Partimenti, in which he sets very beautifully, very contrapuntally, those pieces in three parts. And my experimentation, Peter sh shares uh, this experience with me, is that when we read the figures and when we try to make these versetti into actual music, the way to go is three parts. I hope that I'll be I will be able to show that. As I have stipulated <coughs> there, sorry, as I have stipulated there, the multiple ve versions um, are very important. That we that we search for as many versions that we can, and then we have several techniques to do that. Important techniques are thinking, as I have said, in hit point notes in main notes and that we we we, we make uh, diminutions of that how can we uh, go from hit point note one to hit point note two i can go do i can go like that i can go like that or i can go like that that i will show also imitation also a big deal in this style so this is something that always reoccurs in multiple versions. A student always had to search for possibilities to, to, to include imitation. It's fascinating to see that in the 100 versetti, there are only two in which Mattei himself stipulates literally that imitation is, is, is necessary. But there are so many, uh, in every versetto, there is a possibility to include imitation. Invertible counterpoint, that's also a reflex that we should have. So this means that, especially in three-part textures, when you start a certain phrase, you make a beautiful phrase, then check always if those two voices can be swapped. Not always, but often they can. And so thinking in large-scale form, thinking um, to a richness of setting, this is a very important tool. When you have an inventio, you give it the first time like this. Then you have, for instance, a small modulation if we run in a major key, a small modulation to the tone of the dominant. Will we give that same inventio in the same disposition? No. We will swap those two voices. So that's also something we observe that they trained over and over again. Suspensions, chromaticism, reharmonization, that we will see in my uh, discussion of the first versetto. Let's go. So here I have put uh, the, the, the edition of 24 on top and the autograph, it's an autograph by the way, the autograph of 88, 1788 um, on the bottom. There is one fascinating difference and that is this spot. 
So what we have here, if we speak in schemata form, that's something people know well, we have a printer. I have four, three, two, by a five, one. So if I play it in its, in its very basic form, and this is exactly what he writes in the early version, F, E, D, C. And for some reason, he decided on making the cadence uh, in bar three somewhat more, that it somewhat stronger. Because the bass goes from D to G before going to C, it has more structural impact. Why? Because we see that is an option that we have. Here it is the tenorizans, what we call the tenorizans, or the 2 1 cadence. It's a milder cadence. When I play the 1824 version, I have. somewhat more, more uh, finishing quality. Remember this, because this is, um, we will come back to this when we deal with the figures of the lesson. So what I propose is that we go through the versetto fragment per fragment, as you would do when you improvise, as you would do when you compose. You have a certain gesture, another gesture needs to follow that initial gesture, and that second gesture has to be followed by a third one, etc., etc., etc. What do we have? A very interesting and a tricky beginning. Why is the beginning tricky? The beginning is tricky because of this. If you don't, if you didn't see that, you just start and you play. <laughs> And now we have a little problem because the B in the middle voice, being the seventh or the leading note, would like to go up. But at the same time, my um, on the second on the downbeat of the second bar, I have a seven, and that seven being a non-essential dissonance. I won't explain that now. Being a dissonance needs preparation. So this preparation means that the D on the middle of bar uh, 1, the fifth, has to be a consonant. It stays and it becomes seventh before it resolves. You will see that I have used uh, a bit of a color code. I've amused myself, you will see different colors. Red means questionable. Voila. Clear, I think. So here you see that the alto voice goes from 7 to 5, which in an inner voice, I could have called that orange, is perhaps still more or less uh, okay. So when I play this, you get... which is a fairly good beginning, but we need to do something about this, this voice leading. A way out of trouble is to give musical sense, to give melodic sense, to give contrapuntal sense to the fact that the leading note doesn't rise, but that the leading note descends. By the way, what I often hear is that a leading note has to resolve. That is not true, because a leading note is not a dissonance. A leading note is a note with a, with, with a directional tendency, so a leading note goes up, or as is the case here, it goes down, but the leading note doesn't resolve. Okay. So in this case, as being a good uh, counterpoint uh, pupil, I have come up with the idea of inserting an A in between the B and the G. So, sorry, pushed on the wrong button. Here, I have put this A in between this B and the G. And at the same time, I have made an, a contrapuntal motif out of it that I will imitate half a bar later. So in that case, it becomes much more acceptable that the leading note is just gliding down stepwise. 
we can still um, improve on this, improve, have other versions of this start. I've spoken to you about the, the, the possibility, and I even would say the, the fact of encouraging the changing of the baseline. I could make this even stronger, better, when the bass joins in. And this is a typical texture. When we have um, three parts, often two parts will do quite of the same thing, and another, another, another part will stay alone. So here we have parallel thirds in middle and lower voice, while this beautiful B stays there to become a dissonance. <laughs> something that starts to resemble at a, as an actual um, piece. There is still room for improvement. When I go back to this slide, being a good Partimento student, I know that when a bass note lasts longer than one beat, and I'm in 4-4, I should do something extra. What I have here on beat 3 and 4 is that I have twice the same sonority. I have twice a G major sonority. I have learned in my very first lesson of Partimento, the cadenza composta. This means that instead of giving immediately the G major chord, I will postpone the B, giving first the C to add spice to the, to the setting. And this is something that I can introduce in the middle voice. So there you see that I have used a purple, if it is visible, a purple note. Purple means it is not specified in the figures. It is something that I have added, some, some spice that I have added to the setting. And so in this case, I get, I will repeat the dissonance now. And you see that, uh, that is what is beautiful here is that my motif that is imitated becomes longer. I have my motif in the inner voice. And on the third beat of the first bar, the, 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 the top voice does exactly the same one step higher. I just play those two voices now. When we have this, it's obvious um, that we will change the very first note in the top voice into a rest. It's a bit of a pity that this beautiful imitation is somewhat covered up thanks to or due to the presence of the third. We would like to have the, the third, we are, uh, the third is beautiful, but when you start pieces or an important uh, cadences or at the end of a piece, you don't have to have the third. You can just have an octave, you can have a unison even in the, three, in the three voices. So what I would do is that I would change this E on the first beat into a half note rest. And as such, I have an, what I find a very convincing version. <laughs> Now, when the tempo is slow, uh, yeah, I, I have, I have another, another version first, sorry. I've spoken about, about adding more spice. One of the, the things that you can always do is scan very well for, um, excuse, for, an, for an, um, a sideway. We are in C major, but being a good counterpoint student, I have seen that there is a half note, half tone in the bass. I have E, F. Every half tone, every half tone, has the potential of being a leading note and a tonic. So what I'm doing here is that I have changed my B natural into a B flat. to make this, this parfum of F major, but without re really being in F major. It's just a uh, parfum of F major, and then we can, we can go back to, uh, to C major. 
That was the example that I was referring to uh, uh, just one minute ago. When the tempo is, or, or I mean, when the tempo is too slow, or when you want to have more running eight notes, this is a very important technique. Have a look perhaps back first at the first bar here. What is happening? You have the C in the middle voice. The C becomes dissonance, dissonant on the middle of the bar and resolves on beat four. Instead of having this version, I can decide of ornamenting the suspension. And the easiest way of ornamenting the suspension is by repeating it on the, on the weak beat of the on the weak part of the beat. And that is what is happening here. This, this is a very convincing solution on the harpsichord. So when you play on a harpsichord with a short uh, sound, it's fantastic to repeat the dissonance. So when I play... The resolution almost sounds as an accent. While... Works much better. In this, in this, uh, on this type of instrument, obviously a B flat is also possible there. I've spoken to you about the the checking for swappability, if that is a word uh, in English. So that I, I have done here. So now the, the the what was the inner voice becomes the upper voice, and vice versa. And what was I think perfectly accept acceptable before in the other. Uh, disposition becomes okay but I would not call this an ideal situation we hear that this leading note steps down okay and on top of that we have the we have on the on the on the second bar we have the third on top instead of the seventh and the sixth on top this is doable, so this could be this could be usable, I would say, for a, a transposition in the piece. I would not start with this. Okay. This is obviously when you when you rip away the ornamentation that it becomes intolerable, so to speak, with the leading note in the top voice. This is weak voice leading absolutely to avoid. By the way, I will publish uh, an essay with all these slides commented. So you can read everything at ease, at home, in a couple of days. <laughs> there are other solutions to what I call the leading note problem. And those solutions, for me, depend on tempo. If the tempo is too slow, it does not really work. Have a look at this solution. So what do I do here? I don't have my fifth in the middle of the bar. So I have a doubling of the bass and a third. And then on the fourth beat, I leave my third to leap to the fifth to be able to prepare the seventh. The problem here is that when I play it too slowly, open fifth sticks out too much. So these kind of, uh, this kind of solution really depends on, on the tempo of the piece. So when it is fairly fluid, this is a, this is a, 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 a good uh, solution. Just looking at the time, I will go ahead a little bit. There are other versions that you can see. So what I'm doing here is improving the texture contrapunt-wise by changing the first minim in the middle voice, it, um, half note I speak, uh, that language would probably be easy for everyone, uh, in, an, in an, a quarter note rest and a quarter note. So you have more the ping pong in the top voices. And obviously I can fill in, this is a nice uh, solution I think, I can fill in those leaps of, um, of thirds, and so here I have this passing note every time. And to complement the running eight note motion, I have stolen the motif from bar two and a half and three in the bass, and I have anticipated it. 
So instead of having a half note in the second half of the first bar, I have a dotted quarter note followed by an eighth note, F. So... <laughs> repeated there the D to make the running eight notes completely. This is a version I would advise against because of the fact that um, in the top voice actually nothing changes. I still have the leap from the B to the D but the problem is here that the inner voice also leaps from the D to the G and so you accentuate this open fifth in a too obvious way. Sounds not so nice. That was our first fragment. There are many, 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 many more uh, options. You could work with other kinds of imitations. Um, you know the, what Erdingen has called the Monte Romanesca, what, partimen, what in partimental methodology is called up a fifth, down a fourth. One of the favorite Moti del Basso by, uh, by Eve, by the way, also mine. So typical for this gesture is this, this, this ascending um, fourth. It's something that you can use here also. The f inner voice goes up a fourth, for instance, staying on the C, and now the upper voice goes down the fourth. So there are many, many, many more possibilities, but time is limited. Can I help or protest? Of course. Um, <coughs> can, can you take the mic? Uh, well, that's a <laughs> For the people at home. Um, it's so fascinating on the, in the second measure. Um, do you have any, would you have any solution to um, provide a, for a, a ninth? Yes, we but we are not we are not there yet. Ah. So this will be this, <laughs> this is coming now, my oh. dear Tobias. Oh, I thought you were you were proceeding. Yeah. You are shooting my pigeons, oh. like like we say in Dutch. <laughs> it's obviously as always is it actually is an interesting point. That we have finished, so to speak, the first fragment and we, we start the second fragment. But obviously, an end point is very often a beginning point. And so here we have this, this juncture, so to speak, offers a lot of, a lot of uh, possibilities. This is the, st the straightforward um, version. This is, um, yeah, as I've mentioned also there. This is what Jerdingen has called a print. So I have four, three, two, one. And here in the edition of 24, we have the insertion of five. In the autograph, do you remember, we have a half note D. And so the texture is, you know it, I don't, I mean, you don't have to uh, go elaborate too much. Parallel thirds in one voice, a laying note in one, in another voice, it stays as long as it as it can until it becomes dissonant. It goes down and it goes up again. And there is also this smell of imitation between, in this case, the upper voices. You have a free note being the fifth. It becomes the seventh on the downbeat, and it resolves. The same thing actually happens one beat later in the middle voice. Third becomes the seventh, and it resolves. I was referring to um, thinking of the old version, the 88 version, in function of this, what we have done here, because the seven is only stipulated there, under the D. It's not stipulated under the, the G. For me, this is an, this is an oubli. This is, um, what, this is something that he has forgotten to, to, uh, to add as, as obvious uh, uh, figure. Because the F would have stayed in the old version. Imagine that we have here a half note D. You would have kept exactly the same realization. You would not have gone to the G. That would have been poor setting. 
this is the thing to do, you will not do. This is not right. So, um, I can use this beautiful motif, this anapest motif, two, two, two short notes and a longer note. I can make that more prominent. So what I have done here is that I have changed the bass. Instead of playing a dotted quarter note, I have changed it in, an, in, a, in a normal quarter note and I have repeated the note. So again, you see that two voices join each other and then you have a long note staying, uh, they becoming a dissonant. And then imitation starts to uh, uh, impose itself. So here I, I have chosen to abandon the possibility of imitation here, of not imitating this note anymore here, but I have chosen to, to, to for the for the for the more um, moving motif. So you get this something which has more which has more drive to it, and I can go one step further. While here I have preserved the the the, the, yeah, the figure by by Matei, here I am slightly ignoring it, or more I'm 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 dislocating it, in order to have this beautiful uh, imitation in all the voices. And so this is another possible version. <laughs> So in this case, this, the, the top voice is happy to join the contrapuntal fabric. So hence my, my purple notation. I've put the seven in purple notation and the top D in purple as well. Until now, we have treated, perhaps I, I, I just go back once. We have treated the fourth beat of the second bar as a prolongation of the same chord. I was, I was astonished. I mean, I was intrigued by this notation. I was intrigued by the fact that Matei, I'll go back one more, that Matei writes a, quarter no a dotted quarter note followed by an eighth note and not two quarter notes, which would have been the standard way of, of going about things in this gesture. So he writes, and a trained student in that time sees a possibility there. Because it goes down stepwise. So this means that he will have, I always say he, it's dreadful, because they were the, boy, the boys only were trained in this terrible thing today. It is the way it is. So he will know I have the possibility of making that F on the fourth beat, so on the moment of the dot, a moment of dissonance. And so this is, is another solution which you will see here. This is what the Germans call the 5-2 chord. So I, I am thinking on the moment of the dot that I'm, that I'm playing an E, but I don't play the E yet. So instead of playing... I play, so it 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 ça uh, soulève. It makes the the, the it r it makes the four beat a better note than its metric position uh, uh, suggests. So it lifts. That's the word I was looking for. It lifts the first the, the fourth beat, making it a completely other gesture than much more much more free this is much more engaging so the, 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 the one where you treat it as a consonant or the one where you treat it as a dissonant the one is not better than the other it's just different but you need to have this you have, you have to have seen this because you might need such a, such a gesture at a certain point in your composition career Another way of doing this is not treating it as a 5-2, but as a plus 4-2.
So in this case, the F is really a, 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 a foreign chord factor. It is really what we call a non-essential dissonance. While here, in this case, it is an essential dissonance. We have this typical plus four chord, which is an entity in itself. And then we have the resolution on the last eight notes. So I play just from the beginning of the bar. This is inversion. I go a little bit quicker looking at the time. These are the same kind of things, but with, with the voices uh, swapped. Just uh, have another look at what I have said earlier. The easiest way of maintaining rhythmic flow is by repeating a dissonance on the weak part of the beat. It's perhaps worthwhile to play this. Tobias, are you happy? Ah, yes. Ah, yes. So this is this is an, an, an another way um, again in a more slow tempo. Another way of seeing this gesture is that you start to look again out of the box. Instead of seeing parim pampin as clearly something belonging to C major, you can see the tira as a moment of D minor. Tiram is not necessarily 3-2, speaking of, of this, huh? this is not necessarily 3-2 in C, but you can treat this as 2-1 in D minor. And then you have a beautiful way of um, repeating this gesture here. So you have C sharp D, which is followed by B C. You get this also makes you think probably of a, of, a, of a schema that you know. You could call this a fonte, but I don't I don't agree with that to call this a fonte because a fonte, when you read Rito, he's very specific about that, has a formal function. A fonte is used in a certain spot in a composition. So you can you can learn from that that, that kind of voice leading is something which you can use and be embedded in other gestures. But speaking of a fonte in this case is for me historically not, it does not have much sense. So I will play this one and just to, to mention uh, another possibility of making the, the third beat of bar two interesting, I have held the G a bit too long and so instead of having a 4-3 suspension, I have a 9-8 suspension. And then... Again, it needs a tempo which is fairly slow. There is a lot of information to digest. But it is a possibility that we have with all the, with all the motifs also. Speaking again of, of dissonance, so in this case I came back to treating the dot as a prolongation of the same sonority, but what I can also do is that again I will treat the dot as a moment of dissonance, but instead of staying within C major, I can produce that dissonance in the context of D minor, and this is what I have done here, so I have put the C sharp on the dot. And so in this case I have an expressive uh, interval of an augmented fifth going a moment into, into, uh, into D minor. So I get... Another possibility to set this very straightforward bass. When we want running notes, I have foreseen a version here with running notes. I just what I forgot to set to to to, uh, to mention is this motif has a name in Germany. I never came across a name for this in Italy. Do you know what what, what is it called? They speak of suspirans. So a suspirans is it's much more difficult to explain than than than, than to see. 
is actually a motif starting off beat, and you have three consecutive notes, uh, four consecutive notes um, that step down or step up. So, for instance, the bracketed uh, motifs here are what we call in German Zuspirans motifs, and this permits you, of course, to have to have a, a, a texture which, from the second half of the first bar, produces running eight notes. We have a, a very uh, contrapuntal, free-flowing kind of version. Here I have produced the other type of dissonance on the middle of bar two. So we have seen the 9-8 suspension. Now I have produced the 4 Three suspension. And as you see, I have added a little arrow here. This is a major voice leading thing. When you play, right, in three parts, and when you have a sixth chord followed by a triad, when you have a rising second in the bass and on the, on the, on the, on the second, in, on the first note, you have a, a, a sixth chord. And then on the second note you have a triad, you will very, very, very often have this voice leading. Because what will you do as first choice? You will put the, the sixth on the first note, you will put the third on the second note. The, the first thing that you see when you study counterpoint. Sixth, third. When in a, in a, in a three-part uh, texture, the sixth chord will be complete. So this means you will add the G to the first sonority. And now I can choose. I can go to a doubled F. Or I can go down a fifth to the C. In this case, the C is much, much, much better than the F. Why is the C much better than the F? When I play an F in three parts, the B flat does not receive its um, its function as a dissonance enough. It is not the bass note that makes the fourth really dissonant. It is the presence of the fifth that makes the fourth dissonance. You get the seventh. So in this case, it is really very good to have this descending fifth in the middle voice. Obviously, because the C is there, chromaticism is beautiful. Right. Um, we are. I have a lot of versions. I propose to go all to 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 pass some versions now. I would like to go to the. To the third uh, uh, fragment. Anyway, you will read all about those other versions in my essay in a couple of days. Let's have a look at the, at the, at the, at the, at the third fragment. What do we have? We have a descending bass. That is a gold mine for settings. I have mentioned here, I have stipulated here, one possible way of seeing this bass is by thinking of it as a falling thirds pattern. Like uh, etc. You know this piece, of course. Think of this piece when we when we look at the first couple of settings. So you will think that every um, I mean I say I say another way that on every beat you think a triad apart from the second scale step. On the D, obviously you have to do something else because that is what we call. 2-1 uh, cadence, oops, sorry, wrong button, that is what we call a 2-1 cadence or tenorisans, there we need the sixth to go to the octave. And so this means that I think triad, 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 and actually this has been stipulated by Matei. I have written here an extremely modest uh, version, it is just to make you, to make you hear the, 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 the harmonies. 
The end is quite nice with this line that uh, goes up, but we have many, many more possibilities. Let's go on. When we have this descending bass figure, um, or, or when a partimento student sees this descending bass figure, there is a trigger in his head immediately. He knows there is a lot of possibility for imitation. We know this from Partimenti, where we have such gestures that the composer very often writes imit or imitazione on, uh, on top of that spot. And then the, the student knows, ah yes, I have to imitate. So what I have done here, that I have respected meter, and I have, uh, I, I, I was thinking, yes, I start on a strong beat with A, G, F, I will imitate that on the weak beat A, G, F, and I get... Very good. Good possibility. I could, if you look here, I'm quite low, and so the imitation here appears in the top voice. I could decide on going up, making the A minor chord stick out a little bit more, and then having the imitation not in top voice but in inner voice. So I have... It's also a nice version because it makes the first beat better. It makes the imitation also more specifically on A. It makes it clear that it starts uh, on A. By the way, blue means interesting. <laughs> as simple as that. Now we can go on making the imitation more and more interesting, more and more complex. What I have done here is that I have, let's go back just one, look to the bass. So here, I have a quarter note C, and then I have an, an, an eighth note there, an octave higher. I have changed this into a quarter note, a dotted quarter note C, and then I have what we call in English an octave displacement. You know this term? This means that the line actually goes on, musically goes on, um, but you have taken your scissors and you have, you have uh, cut out the continuation of the line and you have uh, st uh, stuck it an octave higher or an octave lower. In this case, an octave uh, lower. Higher, sorry. And so in this case, I am focusing on another kind of imitation. I am focusing in the first place on the imitation starting, you see it by this hook, starting on the upbeat, which I have put there, also in here. So we play this one. obviously very nice because this has this kind of rubbing on a weak part of the beat which makes this really vibrate. So in my playing I will play that eighth note better than its metric position. So I will not just play... That's an opportunity that we have missed. make that a little longer, a little better, to make this imitation stand out and also to have this nice friction. But there is also an idea of imitation starting on the strong beat. It's not literal, but still, I have a dotted quarter note, I have a dotted quarter note. It's not a C, but it's an E. Same time, you have this big leap, you have this big leap. So this fantastic, this duality uh, imitation. Imitation does not have to be literal always. Often the suggestion of imitation suffices to, 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 to make the, the, the musical interest at that spot. Notice that I have put this C into, into purple. Why? Because it's not stipulated in the, in the figure. It would be a pity not to play that, not to play that seventh in this context of, of beautiful imitation. So in this case, I would even dare to say it's not optional, it's, it's mandatory. I could go a step further in thinking as a contrapuntist, and I could start, as I have done here, tasto solo, only the bass. And the, the advantage, of course, of the descending bass is that when I am stepping down, I'm third lower. And so at that spot, I can literally imitate what the bass has done. But I can only do that once, because when I do that, uh, 
files, I think I have included them, yes. When I, tr when I give the second invitation, I have wonderful parallel fifths there, which are... And red means? Red means fantastic. <laughs> 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 so let's go back to the, to, the, to the former slide. What I've said just 30 seconds ago, the suggestion of imitation is more important than the actual going, not going through the imitation, is illustrated here. So the third voice here is still involved in the imitation, but it's just the first note. And then, then I hold it to become a uh, seventh. a very accomplished version as well that we saw. What we have done until now is we have treated the bass um, as consisting of chordal factors and passing notes. Tarum, parum, parum. Good, bad, good, bad, good. When the tempo, again, I'm there with my tempo, but it is a major factor in, in, in uh, improvisation and, and in setting pieces. Tempo is huge, harmonic rhythm is huge. When the tempo is slow, I can decide here not to go about things in quarter notes, but to go about things in eight notes. And this can be rewarding in the context of visioning a cadence. Very often, less in the second half of the 18th century, but almost always in the, 18, in the first half of the 18th century, there is a speeding up of harmonic rhythm. So this is an interesting, a necessary tool to have. What I have done here is that I have learned the motto del basso, this motto del basso, which we call today stepwise romanesca, whatever the name is. So I alternate between triad and sixth chords, triad and sixth chord, triad and sixth chord. I have set it here, um, with a middle voice that is potentially um, issueish, problematic. I will play it fast. You hear very strongly the fifth. When I play it slowly, and especially when I articulate between every eight note, which I should do because there are, there are, we, we are speaking about two different harmonies. When I, when I, when I uh, slur, sorry, I make an, a grammatical mistake because I do as if the D belongs to the E and the C, the, the, the B belongs to the, to the C, which is not the case. We have two different harmonies. So in a slowish tempo, this becomes this becomes okay, this is doable. There is another solution, and this is this one. In this case, the middle voice actually produces what the normal Romanesca bass, so a fourth down, a second up, would produce the Bajo del bass. Eh? So it comes here in the middle, while the outer voices um, produce the parallel thirds. And this is obviously a version without many problems. Look also to the end of this bar where I have included a 4-3 suspension, which is not stipulated in the figures, to answer what the inner voice has done here, 7-6, which has not been stipulated in the figures. Uh, not much time anymore. I want to yes. I want to have this. Um, want to show you this version again. When the tempo is slow, you could um, change the focus. So what I am doing here that I'm changing focus of key every two eight notes. So I am thinking tenorisans all over the place. This is tenorisans in A minor. This is tenorisans in F major. This is the horizons in D minor. So each time you get a leading note and a tonic. A leading note and a tonic. A leading note and a tonic. This will make you think, I hope, of another pattern that has been identified. I've, I've mentioned the 
difficult on the slide, so it's not so difficult. <laughs> um, this is a this is a, a pattern that is um, that Mozart was particularly fond of, but that we already find in Corelli in the in the trio sonatas by Corelli. This pattern is very uh, yeah very very much used, and actually the second versetto by Mattei is doing this. Exactly this, this, this pattern. I just want to mention that here I have decided to change the bass from a quarter note D into two eight notes D, G, because I have an octave there. And I was not happy, even if there is another sonority in between, I was not happy with these octaves. So I did not like this. When the tempo is slow, again, it's defendable. When the tempo is a little bit fa faster, it's not so nice. It's better to have. In this case, there is no issue anymore. Other versions. Play it, Say again? Play it, please. I have played it. I did. So. You want that I play the whole thing? Yeah. You asked for it. <laughs> you ask, I do. <laughs> um, yeah, I will pass this one. What I have done here, I won't discuss it because you don't have the time. I have focused on D minor. I see a descending scale that ends on a strong beat on D. And I see this as a unity. And I think, oh yes, I can set this in D minor. But in that case, this note should be chromatically altered. Because this note makes it clear that I'm going to D minor. So this flat is absolutely necessary. So I get... I explain this in detail in my essay. And then we come to the end. Uh, it's already 6 o'clock, so I will perhaps uh, end here. You will see that imitation uh, is still possible, as you see here, by extending the last four notes. You have here the scale. What I have done here is that I have imitated. And I still keep the imitation until the end. Here I deal with, um, the, with, with the cadence itself. The, pseudo doppia if you want a very easy technique to maintain the the eight notes running is compound melody shine polyphony so i go back to into four voice thinking so the alto voice in this case actually represents two individual voices think this g one eight note earlier think this a one eight note earlier eight note earlier eight note eight earlier you get four parts until I do which is an extremely handy way of producing eight notes when you don't have contrapuntal inspiration it's fooling your audience so to speak but it's something which is used very very often etc etc uh, with a lot of with a lot of contrapuntal uh, elements with the suspirants so I have, and in this case, I am I am um, neglecting, denying what Mat what, what Matei asks. He asks for a four-three suspension, but as badly behaved uh, partimentista, I have changed this in another kind of suspension, namely nine-eight. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.